Welcome to worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. My name is Reverend Jennifer Innes. It is my great joy to be the minister with this congregation of people of all ages at all stages of life. We are so glad that you are here this morning to take this day and this opportunity to be together. We are an intentional community gathered around our shared promise to support each other's spiritual journeys. So let us worship together all gender identities, sexual orientations, abilities, racial and ethnic identities, and politics. And may we root ourselves in the values of this faith, compassion and courage, transcendence, justice, transformation, and service. And as we are rooted in our relationships, we recognize our connection with our neighbors and this land. This is the ancestral home of the Peoria people. They were here long before the first Europeans came down the Illinois River. We offer our respect to the Peoria people for who they were and for who they are today. And I especially would like to welcome any guests we have among us today. Please help us get to know you. There are plenty of name tags. And please also stay uh, after service for fellowship and our and coffee hour. If you're joining us online, please stay after the service on Zoom for a conversation there as well. And we have a couple of notes about how we are together. Uh, please, at this moment, if you haven't already, take uh, the time to check that your respective devices are in worship mode, either vibrate or silent. And please see a, a greeter or an usher if you find that you need one of the hearing assist devices at any time during the service. So today we have a couple of uh, ways to gather. Uh, one at about noon or so, we're going to have uh, coffee with the minister in the conference room. This is an opportunity to come and have a chat uh, with me. We can talk about the church, talk and ask me any questions that you have, just a chance to get to know each other in a more intentional way. Um, so I hope you can join us. This is a especially good moment for those who are new to the congregation. And also, uh, also we have a new activity that's starting uh, this month. We have a drum circle that will be here in the sanctuary at 1230 after the service. I have seen a glimpse of the drums. They look like they are a lot of fun. So I highly recommend bringing all ages and getting into making a big noise. I have a couple of notes for this coming week. One on Friday, uh, this congregation is hosting the Trans Day of Visibility uh, Gathering, a service. And it is in honor of Trans Day of Visibility. It is uh, a way for folks who are transgender to be able to be out and about and proud about who they are and to be recognized as the fully human people that they are. And this is getting increasingly challenging. So we're offering this for the community and for all who might gather. I want to invite folks, and it's meant to be all ages as well, so families are welcome. And uh, there'll be a seven o'clock uh, this coming Friday, which is in fact the day of Trans Day of Visibility. And if you'd like to help a little bit, maybe be a greeter, an usher, or help in some other way, please let me know. We're putting things together this week. Next Sunday, uh, next Sunday is the uh, annual campaign kickoff. Oh. There will be worship too. Don't, don't forget to come to worship. But will be the annual campaign kickoff, which will offer a message for that during the service. But also will be a potluck lunch. I want to encourage folks to uh, sign up for something on the pages outside. Sign up electronically on the, from the emails. Come and bring some fellowship and some food, and we will enjoy our, our time together as we start our annual campaign, which is our major um, fundraiser for the year so we can get ready for the next fiscal year. And I think we'll stop there with that. Let me offer and turn to the invitation to greet your neighbor. Uh, this is the return this month of greeting your neighbor. And I know some people are just like, I can't stand it. Let me say hello. Okay. But I also want to remind folks that consent is also part of how we are to gather together. So please ask, check in before you offer a hug or a handshake. But by all means, Say hello with your neighbor, and I will call folks back with our first hymn after a little while. Go forth.
Shipper, lover of the evening, Oz is no caravan of despair. Come yet again, come. All right. So we're going to, thank you. So let me invite you to rise and body your spirit. And we're going to go through our opening hymn. We have been working on this all month and for a while. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And we'll start with the counterpoint, singing four times, and then we'll sing the verse three times. All right. Though you've broken your vows a thousand times, 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 come, come, whoever you are, Wonder, worshiper, lover of the evening, Oz is no caravan of despair. Come yet again, come. Come, come, whoever you are. Wonder, worshiper, lover of the evening, Oz is no caravan of despair. Come yet again, come, 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 whoever you are, wonder, worshiper, lover of me, all this of despair, come yet again, come. Please be seated. And let me invite Pat Denzer to the pulpit. Good morning, everyone. I just look after going through that, Kim. I just love this church. And I love this congregation. You are just an amazing part of my life. So I thank you. Every day I get to come here to church, or every Sunday I get here to come to church. Today's opening words come from Gretchen Haley. Grace meets us where we are. Now, I've practiced this a thousand times, but I guarantee you that somewhere through this, I'm going to fumble. So please bear with me, because the message is good. There is nothing you need to bring with you to be welcome here. No right beliefs or proof of citizenship, no eternal optimism, 
or clarity of conviction, no boundless courage or endless expertise. You do not need, you do not need to know what brought you here or how you will solve that problem you are turning over and over and over again in your mind. Your bills do not need to be paid. Your checkbook can be a mess. Your children may have been up half the night. Your hearing aids may not be working and your knees may be creaking. You do not need to be already perfect or even halfway to belong to the circle where grace meets us where we are, but does not leave us where it found us, where love resides in each of us, and yet is somewhat, somehow more than all, where life still pulses and rages and heals and transforms, creating in us and this day anew once again. Come, let us worship together in love and peace and joy. <laughs> and let me invite Abby and Becca up for our chalice lighting. <laughs> for all those by Reverend Scott Taylor. We light this chalice for those who convinced us that it was safe to share our longings. For those who proved that not everyone will run for, from the weight of the pain that we carry. For those who held us in our fear and helped us heal from our regret. For those whose humble apologies made us believe that we too could be forgiven. And for those whose tenderness helped us see that we no longer need to hide. Our vulnerability frees us. It binds us. It makes the holy path we travel together. May this flame ever help us keep that in view. My colleague, Paul Beadle, reminds me that once upon a time, most folks used the offering plate to fulfill their pledges of financial support. And nowadays, so many folks click on their church websites or set up automatic transfer, which is great. And some, some also, many also still write a monthly check. I have seen the mail. There are monthly checks all the time paying the church bill along with all the others. But passing the offering plate has never been merely a practical exercise. It has always been a ritual. And even if one's pledge is paid up and thank you, it is worthwhile to bring even just some denomination of dollar to drop into the plate as a ritual reminder of the form of love we call generosity. So let it be a reminder that after meeting our obligations to ourselves and our households and the communities of which we are a part and of which, to which we are committed, that we can still also nurture and keep our capacity to give. And the practice of giving cultivated can be so much second nature and first response that can help bring forth the realm of love. And so as part of our acting in our uh, acting out of love and bringing more into the world, we also send a, me a measure of our gifts into service. And we practice share the plate. So half the undesignated offering will be shared with our named recipient each month and half goes to the church. And for this month, this is our last Sunday of March, but for this, for this month, we have been supporting 100 men of Illinois. 
uh, 100 black men of Illinois formed as a symbol of solidarity and strength. And it's a national organization with local chapters. Ours is Bloomington, Peoria. And it's a nonprofit uh, organization with no government funding. They have a mission to improve the quality of life and enhance educational opportunities for African Americans. And they work as a strong force in the world to overcome cultural and financial obstacles that have limited the achievement of some African Americans, especially young African American males. So thank you so much for all the ways that you give and offer yourselves into the world in the service with this congregation. Um, as we pass the plate, a uh, reminder that half the undesignated offering goes to 100 black men of Illinois this month. And please, if you use an envelope, indicate uh, on that whether it's pledge, whether it's share the plate, whether it's the split for the share of the plate. And we will, uh, the ushers will come forward. And while the plates are being passed, we'll enjoy the music for meditation. After the plates have gone by, will be the chance to light candles of care. And so now will the ushers please come forward.
spirit of community in which we share and find strength and common purpose. We turn our mind and hearts toward one another, seeking to bring into our circle of concern all who need love and support, those who are ill, those who are in pain, either in body or spirit, those who are lonely, those who have been wronged. We bring into the circle of community all who are with us in our hearts and minds, all the names and the milestones before us. Now is the sharing of the joys and sorrows of the congregation. I want to thank everyone who was part of making Owen Lindsay's memorial happen yesterday uh, and all who attended. We met with sorrow and celebration, a young man who lived abundantly. And we have a note from BJ and Terrence, Owen's lovely parents, who want to express the joy and gratitude for this beloved community and also offer a note of thanks to me. It was a wonderful gift to be able to offer this celebration for Owen's life. We also offer our heartfelt sympathy to Carlette Corlett as she mourns the loss of her dear friend, Jean Faulkner from Dunlap, who passed on March 22nd. We also offer our care and concern to those who are impacted by uh, the mass shooting that took place over this weekend in Macomb at Western Illinois University. There were 10 injured students and one who has died. Let us hold that community and all who are connected with that community in our hearts as they struggle and recover from such a difficult moment. And in our ever larger world, we want to offer thoughts of healing and recovery to the people of Mississippi and Alabama. An unexpected series of tornadoes went through some of the more rural areas and left 26 dead and many more injured. So many people are already helping and so many lives were devastated. So we offer wishes of health and resources and for finding a way through. Also, I want to recognize that we're in the beginning of the month of Ramadan, the holy month in the Islamic tradition, that people who are observe the practices will be fasting from food and drink during the day as part of their effort to be more connected and more aware of God, to make space in their lives for possibility. Let us hold and extend our care for all of our siblings in faith. Join me as we share one more moment of quiet for all the joys, the sorrows, the names, the milestones that are with us and remain unspoken. Let us take this moment, this present moment, and reside in the peace. Amen, shalom, salam. And let us now turn to our story for the morning. This morning's Time for All Ages is about the perfection of imperfections. It's called the Water Bearer's Garden. A water bearer in India had two large pots and each hung on one end of a pole that he carried across his neck. At the end of a long walk from the stream to the master's house, he would fill his pots. 
after filling his pots and carrying them back to the master's house. One of the pots was only half full. It had a crack in it. While the other pot always delivered every time its full portion of water. For two years, this went on daily, with the water bearer delivering only one and a half pots of water. Of course, the perfect pot was very proud of its accomplishments, perfect for the end for which it was made. And that poor cracked pot was ashamed of its own imperfections. It was miserable that it was only able to do half the job that it was made to do. So after these two long years of what it perceived to be a bitter failure, the pot gathered its courage and spoke to the water bearer one day by the stream. I am ashamed of myself, the pot said. I want to apologize to you. Why? asked the water bearer. What is it that you're ashamed of? Well, I have only been able for these past two years to do half of my job because of this crack in my side, and it causes the water to leak out all the way back. Because of my flaws, you have done all of this work, and yet you do not get full value for your efforts. The water bearer's eyes softened. He looked at the pot in love and said, as we return to the house, please look down and notice all the beautiful flowers along the path. The pot thought, okay, that might cheer me up. And indeed, as they went up the hill, the old cracked pot looked at the, at the flowers, noticed the sun warming them. And this did cheer the pot up some, but at the end of the trail, it still felt sad that it had leaked out half of its load again. And so the pot apologized for its failure. The water bearer said to the pot, but didn't you see? The flowers only grew on the side of the path that you hung from. That is because I have always known about your flaw and I used it. I planted flower seeds on, our, on your side of the path and every day as we return from the stream, you have watered those seeds. I can enjoy the beautiful flowers as well as pick some and give them to my master for his table. Without you being just exactly the way that you are, none of us would have this beauty. We all have our own unique flaws. We all are cracked pots. Don't be afraid of your flaws, acknowledge them, and then you too can be a source of beauty. I wonder where you'll find strength in your weaknesses. Thank you all. I invite the children to join me as we head back to religious education.
spirit of love around you everywhere, everywhere you may go. I'd like to invite Dave Grebner up for our reading today. Penitence Prayer by the Reverend Elizabeth Tarbox. It is an hour before sunrise. The waves keep coming, but each minute they make, they make less progress than the minute before. As the tide goes out, the beach is exposed. A million pebbles just visible in the lifting of night, a periwinkle clinging to a rock a horseshoe crab scrambling to catch the receding ocean, and I am exposed in all my hurts and frailties. My composure drains away with the tide, and the disheveled beach mirrors the ragged edges of my soul. The whole bay is my confessional, the breath of dawn my confessor. I have been so consumed with my own hurts that I've forgotten to call a friend whose hurt is equal to my own. I put off doing those things that might bring healing to someone who is broken, or joy to someone who is sad, or compassion to someone who is at odds with the rhythm of life, because I cared more for my own loneliness. I refuse the hand of one who reached out to me, clinging instead to old, familiar ways. I chose to remain stuck inside a problem rather than ask for help to solve it. I pray that some benevolent spirit has listened to my heart's despair and judged me not. At the edge of the clouds, a rim of cream disappears, appears. Night creeps away with my guilt beneath its cloak. Dawn sprinkles absolution. The earth has kept its promise. Forgiveness is at hand. So this song that we'll be doing at this point is Loosen by Ali Halpert. And in the course of the last few years, we've enjoyed this song on video. Um, and I think we've sung with the video. This morning, we're going to begin to learn how to sing it with our own piano. Thank you, Edith. And so we're going to give this a try. And this is one of those pieces, one of those songs that I really encourage folks to simply let it settle and be in with you and let it just in, be present to the flow of the song. We are not here for perfection. We are here for the music. Right? Right? <laughs> we are here for the presence and the joyful noise we create together. And so we will, uh, so I'll offer it once a cappella. We'll hear it with Edith all the way through. Uh, and then I will watch me and we'll start to sing it together. We'll sing uh, t two times, two times, two times. The first verse twice, the second verse twice, the first verse again twice. Okay. and loose and baby you don't have to carry the weight of the world in your muscles and bones let go let go let go loose and loose and baby you don't have to carry the weight of the world in your muscles and bones let go let go let go Holy 
breath and holy name will you ease will you ease this pain holy breath and holy name will you ease will you ease this pain Loosen, loosen, baby, you don't have to carry the weight of the world in your muscles and bones. Let go, let go, let go. Loosen, loosen, baby, you don't have to carry the weight of the world in your muscles and bones. Let go, let go, let go. Thank you. One of the most powerful lessons I encountered when working with the Montessori method for education was this. We have all the time we need. We have all the time we need. There is so much grace and space in such a simple affirmation. And that affirmation comes from a place of deep fracture. Dr. Marita Montessori developed her method in classrooms in schools from the most impoverished children in the Italian ghettos of the early 1900s. These children were malnourished, living in unhealthy, crowded conditions many of whom were developmentally disabled. In society, they were considered just less than. They were the least of these in that society. But Dr. Montessori wanted to see what could come from them what could happen, what could emerge with these children. And she experimented with various methods to engage them. And the way that she did this was to follow their lead and their feedback. So she would try, put something together, you know, a, a, a toy, a craft, or an activity, whatever it might be, put that in front of the children and see what they did with it. See how they responded, whether they engaged or did not. And at every turn, she observed, changed materials and size and shape and color, everything based on whether and how they worked with what was in the space. And over time, what emerged was what many of us know as a Montessori method, child-sized furniture, space filled with light and nature, lessons that were ones that drew the children kind of naturally in their, you know, stimulated their curiosity and wonder and sense of discovery, motivated by their own progress. They were stimulating materials with texture and form and natural materials, and it let each child move at their own speed. The adults were guides, and the children set the pace. In the decades since Montessori's earliest developments, religious educators have since adapted the method for different faith traditions, for Catholic, Protestant, Unitarian Universalist, Jewish, among others. And this is how I encountered it, as being trained in a religious education version of the Montessori method for Unitarian Universalists. And so when I'm in a classroom, it's been a while, but I, I've always enjoyed being in, uh, in that kind of classroom space. I always try to lead with, we have all the time we need. 
And I will say it's good for me, <laughs> and I hope good for the children. That reminder on the regular of that grace and space. Now, granted, the constraints of, you know, the clock on Sunday morning and the typical uh, time that there is available for a Sunday school or religious education lesson is a bit at odds with the message, I will grant. But at every possible moment, the room, the teacher, the class is encouraged to live in that spirit. We have all the time we need. And the point, in large part, is to provide the most freedom, the most grace and opportunity for discovery, to let that being together liberate and lead us all onward. But it also is a space and an opportunity to help let us wrestle with what's also where we're stuck as well, where things are not great, when something is difficult, when something is not okay, even, even at some level where we are broken. We have all the time we need is a container large enough to allow for all of the existential and emotional and physical questions and hardships and wanderings. You can see this uh, with children in the, in the space that's the work time. Because we have a story, we might tell a story, but then go and have a space where the children can choose from anything they want to work with in the room. Um, and I will say, it might have been one of my children who took that time to draw Ghostbusters figures for an entire year. I don't know what he was working with. I don't know. But that was clearly something that needed to be allowed and present. And so we had pictures of Slimer and all the Ghostbusters in great detail for a whole year. That's the space, right? Who'd love to have a chance to just choose that, right? Yeah, right? Wow. That's what we can do. I am struck by how much we need, even crave, a spacious container when the real life of our lives is so time-limited and constrained. Because time is such our dearest resource, is it not? And yet it also passes by in days, weeks, years in such a blink. So we have, let me first offer that message, we have all the time we need while we are fully mortal and while we are each and every one of us a hot mess. Yes. I mean, that's the nature of the struggle in, in our human institutions and in our religious bodies is to allow for we are fully mortal, and we are fully wonderful, and we are fully all over the place. My motivation for talking about this to a certain degree is recognizing how much we don't know about each other, and sometimes even ourselves, until we are faced with the end of our lives. How much we miss the chance to be in that spaciousness, in that graciousness with each other, and to be more fully known. I can't tell you how many times I wish that we would find ways to not wait till there's a memorial to tell our story, right? Right? But so much of how we live our lives is in a sense of self-protection, how much it can be hard to be known, not just because of where we don't always know what to do with our cracks and fractures, but also for the sake of protecting our social image. I'm okay. Look at me. I'm okay. I'm good. Mm -hmm. How are you doing today? I'm great. Yep. 
The stakes are so high. And this is our life. How might we serve ourselves and each other and grow the kind of grace that could bring all of ourselves into the world? We are so finite and so flawed. Where do we begin? And I recognize we have this question in the moment of when so many of us are feel, feeling such an enhanced risk and danger and brokenness in the world, not of our own making, where there's so many ways in which difference in our social world is being actively squashed, just to name our trans neighbors and our children, or that you have people censoring books and art that would expand the mind and the spirit. And we already have such a long struggle as a society with recognizing the brokenness that shows up in our mental health concerns. We're getting better, but there's still such a long way to go. <clears throat> Unitarian Universalism really tries to offer a message of come as you are. Come as you are, whatever that means to you. And sometimes it's dressing up, and sometimes you feel good for having, like, a fresh handkerchief. Oh, maybe, there's a, maybe not there's a handkerchief, but you're here. And that's good. But it's also in the case in Unitarian Universalism that there's a certain legacy of, uh, that we don't necessarily, that we kind of put on a good face with each other, that we put on a good show of being okay. We don't have uh, the concern about original sin, but we do have a certain legacy of sometimes what people might call salvation by character. Like you show that you are doing spiritually well by, by your own uh, effort, by your own metal, by your own work. And sometimes that can have a certain pressure to it to say, if you're not, if you're not feeling up to the task of taking care of yourself, of building your own character, then are you a failure in the faith? We get that from, honestly, from the 1800s, William Ellery Channing and many others, as well as our social context. We are as susceptible as many other faiths towards the striving for perfection. But what I love about Unitarian Universalism is that we are not perfect. And we are not trying to be. That we are a place of spaciousness where we can allow for the full humanity of ourselves and of each other. This is partially what has been carrying me through being part of this congregation and part of Unitarian Universalism for my entire life, and that there is room to mess up and to learn and to try again. We are not a perfection tradition. We are a wisdom tradition. And sometimes we even actually grow more wise. I want to invite you into a moment of reflection and spaciousness. And just allow ourselves a time. Give yourself the grace of being less than excellent or less than wonderful, less than perfect, I should say. Let this be a moment to enter in to that brokenness. Where are you, as we were hearing the story, the cracked pot? Join me in a short reflection here. I want to invite you into contemplation, meditation. Feel where you are resting, your feet, the seat, the space around you. Feel the love of this community as it surrounds and enfolds. And feel your breath 
as it flows in and out of your body. Listen to your heartbeat. Listen to your heart. How is it? How is it with your heart? Does your heart feel whole, shielded by intellect, or cocooned by reason, or closed to feeling? Or is it broken, fragile to the touch, brimming with the pain of loss? Has your heart been broken and healed so many times that it now lies open to the world? Knowing that true growth does not come without pain, that tears may wear down barriers, that we may carry the hearts of others even when our own is too heavy to bear. How is it with your heart? None of us has has an unblemished heart, not one. For perfection is found only in death. And we, we are alive. And we are alive and have so much to heal. Let us in this moment offer ourselves the space to be broken. What are those places What are those moments? Let this be a moment of confession for yourself alone. That is sufficient for now. But done within the embrace of the community. You have all the space you need to be in as many pieces as you are. As we come out of this meditation, it may be that you will remain amidst the brokenness, and that is okay. You may not hear any more of the sermon, and that is okay. But let this moment be a space of holding and recognition for all that you are, for all the parts that you are inside. I so appreciate one of the people who's been very good at talking about brokenness, which is Will Wheaton. Will Wheaton is an actor, a writer, a performer. And if you recognize the name, he was someone who was uh, featured largely in Star Trek, The Next Generation. At that time, he was a teenager, coming of age within being in the show, being the the young upstart uh, Wesley, Wesley, in The Next Generation. And coming into himself and moving on into his adulthood. Now, Will Wheaton talks about his experience as a child actor and where he, in his case, was forced into that work by his parents His father ignored him or bullied him. There was no, or belittled him. 
His mother forced him into, the, into acting, emotionally manipulated him into his work as a child. In short, Will Wheaton really didn't get a childhood. He was very good at what he did. But he was also not hardly ever listened to as a person. And that took its toll. And over, his, over the course of his life, he developed um, complex um, PTSD and, and had to find a way through that. And so part of what he does is talk about mental health concerns and the difficulties of being a child actor and, and bring that out into a human space. What he says was the space he, he disassociated from most of his childhood memory. But he has one, one place where he remembers well. And that's when he went to the library. The library is a safe space. Because one librarian saw him and observed him well enough to go and approach him and say, what would you like to explore? What would you like to read? What would you like to encounter? Even when he didn't feel anybody was paying attention to him at all. And that one person guided him towards this book and another book and another book, which he consumed voraciously. And it gave him life and, and it gave him a sense of being seen. And he was deeply affirmed in that recognition of the library is a safe place. And he goes forth and talks about this. And he has moved forward in his process and in his adulthood to be an advocate and to be a voice. And then he takes the power that he has as such, the privilege, because he's a white, cisgender, uh, able-bodied male. And he, as he says, with the celebrity bonus card, so he brings this power out into the world to say, one, here's trauma. This wasn't okay. And if you're experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder, you are still fully human, even though this is profoundly broken in your life. And he also points out the value and the liberation of a place like the library. How much we need spaces of discovery, of recognition, of simply being able to move through and connect. We need places of trust, spaces where we can <clears throat> cultivate and care for our mortal selves. So it might be the library, it might be the church, but I want us to go forth and remember finding the ways that we get to claim our broken places and know that we have all the space we need to do so. So as a congregation, we might say, come as you are, discover who you are, and then prepare the space for our own hearts, for those who are here, and for those who will come. I so appreciate the librarian or the Montessori method or what have you that says, I see you and I invite you in all your flaws and all your fabulousness. It is all there. It's not a simple resolution. It is not finished work. There's no one conclusion to the message, but it is a chance to keep going in the flow and the ebb of our lives. Our time is so limited and our opportunities so precious and what we can offer each other is so vast. Let us be a good gift to ourselves, to our children, and to our neighbors no matter how much of a mess we may be, there is still so much to give. Let us go forth. Amen.
Please join me for our closing hymn, which is Meditation on Breathing. Please rise and body your spirit. And this is one where it's, we'll simply sing two parts. And we'll sing each part four times, or the first part, the second part, the first part again, four times each. And we'll have the music from Edith. And it's, let me just offer it. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love, and the drone is, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. It's that simple. So when I breathe in, we'll go four and four and four. Just watch me. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. I breathe in, I breathe in. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Thank you for all of your witness to the broken places. Thank you for your commitment to hold yourself and one another in a great and steadfast love. Moving forward from this space, may we continue to nurture our spiritual growth. May we continue to travel along the winding path to healing whatever brokenness we individually and collectively hold, knowing that we do not travel this path alone. Our worship is ended. Let our service begin. <laughs>